charges of rape, all too common. From ABC News, this is Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. I was going to begin by saying that we've brought you the story of Kerry Max Cook before. And then I realized the foolishness of presenting one slice of anybody's life as though that could possibly be the story. It certainly seemed that way back in December of 98. By then, Mr. Cook had been on death row for 13 years. He'd been convicted for the murder and sexual mutilation of a young woman. And then an appeals court had ordered him set free pending a new trial. Since that time, DNA analysis has shown that Cook was not the man who'd had intercourse with the woman, and authorities have identified the man who did. But that, too, is only part of the story. Kerry Max Cook also endured something else while in prison, something that is the subject of a report that Human Rights Watch is releasing this week. When Cook went to prison, he was only 21. He was young, he was vulnerable, and he was gang raped. The fact that he was also innocent of the crime is almost incidental. When a man is convicted of a crime, the sentence that a judge pronounces never includes sodomy or rape or AIDS, for that matter. But when that becomes part of the punishment, where does a prisoner turn? ABC correspondent Dan Harris has been working on the story. Bada boom, bada bang. Gotta go to, gotta get it, gotta go to. Since getting out of prison, Carrie Max Cook has acquired all the trappings of a normal life. A wife, a son, to whom he gave the middle name Justice, even a dog. But in his most private moments, Cook says, his mind inevitably returns to the horror and humiliation he encountered behind bars. Rape. At times I feel self-hatred. I feel like I should have ended it by taking my own life to stop it. I feel like the cost is too exorbitant to be here at times. The rapes began, Cook says, when fellow inmates cornered him only weeks after he entered the Texas prison system. They made me take my clothes off. They bent me over a concrete uh, embankment that used to sit outside in the, in the yard. And uh, he held my, my head into the concrete and uh, he anally assaulted me, and then the other guy forced me to go down on him. And then as I laid there with my legs spread, face into the concrete, faces that I, I couldn't look behind me to see, I just knew I felt uh, being entered again and again. At the end of this gang rape, Cook says the inmates took a knife and carved profanities into his backside. This was my welcoming committee to Texas death row. And from there on, you're a, quite literally, a marked man. I was most definitely a marked man. Once an inmate is raped, he is known in prison parlance as a turnout or a punk. And unless a punk is willing to fight, sometimes to the death, he remains a target. I made the decision to survive. So you didn't fight it? You just had to grit your teeth. I just had to grit my teeth and hope that, uh, and hope that uh, people would see that I was innocent and that someone would stop the madness. One of Cook's survival techniques was to sign up with a daddy, a stronger inmate who would offer to protect him. It's a compromise made by many inmates, according to Harvard criminologist Dr. James Gilligan. By submitting to one man and being that person's sexual slave, he then uh, get some degree of protection, but at the expense of being literally just repeatedly used by this person. The prisoners who endure it and the experts who study it say prison rape is less about sex than it is about power and dominance. Prison inmates have lost control over almost every aspect of their lives, their food, their schedules, their movements. Raping a weaker inmate is a way to gain nearly total control over somebody else. In prisons that are overcrowded and understaffed, Guards and administrators may tacitly permit rape as a means of maintaining order. 
one of the most effective ways to divide and conquer is to let one group of prisoners be predators and another be prey. And when inmates like Cook ask for help, they are often met with ridicule. If you can't do the crime, don't do the time. You're not here for uh, me to babysit you. You're on your own. You've got to go out and be a man. Texas prison officials say they investigate all claims of rape. Bring us documented proof and we will investigate it. I cannot imagine a correctional officer uh, turning his head on, a, on an act of violence on an inmate. Correctional officers turn their heads all the time, according to Johnny Vasquez, who used to be a Texas prison guard. They just do not care. It's something that, hey, I've got better things to do with my time. Uh, it's kind of like, how dare you come into my office taking up my time with uh, such a puny, uh, you know, thing. You know, hey, go out there and take care of yourself. Don't come in and bother me about it. Prison inmates don't inspire a lot of sympathy among the general public. For that reason, there hasn't been any great outcry over this issue of prison rape. But prison reformers say there are some powerful reasons for the public to care. The vast majority of the nearly two million inmates in this country will ultimately be released. And those who have been raped may bring some serious problems with them into the community. Some, like Kendall Spruce, will carry HIV. Spruce, who was convicted of a misdemeanor, says he was infected after being raped in this prison in Arkansas. I got a death sentence. I got a death sentence. Others, like Matthew Rowland, will carry incalculable rage. I've never hated a person. I mean, truly hated a person until that happened. I wanted to see this person dead. Michael Robtoy, who was raped behind bars as a teenager, says he murdered a gay man after being released as a way of regaining his manhood. He says all prison rape victims are time bombs. They may blank it out of their mind, push back in their subconscious, but it's always going to be there. And it will come back to haunt you. I mean, you mean society itself. So it's not just your problem, it's our problem. It's everybody's problem. It's the world's problem. Most importantly, though, prison reformers say the public should care because this is a massive human rights violation taking place in our midst. And sometimes the victims are innocent people. I live to tell this story, but I paid a very, very high price to be here. It's as if they took away your manhood. They did take away my manhood. It's not as if they did. They certainly did. In a civilized society, Cook says, we send criminals to prison for confinement and deprivation, not torture. I'm Dan Harris for Nightline in Plano, Texas. Two men who were on the front lines, they were correctional officers at a maximum security prison and an attorney helping inmates fight back after they've been raped, will join us in a moment. Joining us now from San Francisco, Donna Brorby. She is the lead counsel in a class action suit by inmates against the Texas prison system for failing to protect Texas inmates from rape, among other acts of violence. We're also joined by two former prison guards who wrote books about their experiences. From New York, writer Ted Conover, who spent 10 months as a corrections officer at New York's Sing Sing Prison. He is the author of the book, New Jack. And from Boston, Michael McLaughlin, author of Screw, the truth about Walpole State Prison by the guard who lived it. He spent four years at the Massachusetts facility. Mr. Conover, I'd like to begin with you because I gather of all of our three guests, you're the one who is least inclined to believe that this is a systemic problem, a massive problem. Tell me why. Well, I guess because my personal experience was that there was not a lot of this going on. I'm not here to say it doesn't go on in other places or even that a lot of it uh, doesn't go on, but I went into Sing Sing to see what it was like to be an officer, to see what the environment was like, to answer the questions of people like me about prison. And I've got to tell you, almost the number one question is, uh, how quickly am I going to get raped if I get sent in there? So I, I got known as someone who was sort of obsessed with this subject. I asked a lot of inmates about it and a lot of officers. And at the end of the day, I only heard one account of a rape by officers who said it was about a year past. And uh, 
my conclusion was that at least at Sing Sing, uh, most of the sex between prison inmates was consensual. Now, when you say consensual, the only reason I'm going to stop you on that is we just heard in the, in the previous report that sometimes a particularly a young man or a weaker man who is not able to defend himself will turn himself over, in effect, to a larger, stronger man and become his partner. Uh, that could theoretically be seen as consensual. I'm not sure I would see it that way. Well, I, I know just what you're saying, and I think most of the viewers know about this fabled punk daddy system where an inmate's forced to submit to one powerful inmate to protect himself. I mean, it's a staple of every movie about prisons. Uh, even Oz, you know, the supposedly hyper-realistic show, has, uh, has the middle-aged white guy submitting to another guy for protection. And I'm not saying it doesn't happen, it's just, uh, it was particularly the older inmates who cast light on this for me. They said, you know, that's the way it used to be around here. In the old days, uh, the inmate who was the punk wouldn't rat out the rest of them because he didn't want to didn't want to get beat up. But he's, they said things have changed. You know, uh, prisons now take the their care and their care role more seriously. An inmate requesting protection gets put in protective custody, or else he can file a lawsuit. Let me hear from Mr. McLaughlin, who's who's also been a correctional officer. What's your view? Well, I've seen, I had seen many instances of inmates uh, being assigned to cell blocks based on uh, uh, their ability perhaps to serve the needs of other inmates. Um, each cell block has a, a, a number of predators and uh, they need a certain number of prey to, uh, uh, to more or less have their way with. Um, it's a way of uh, paying gambling debts, etc. I'm glad to hear that Sing Sing didn't have the problems that Walpole had back in the uh, 70s. Uh, Walpole was run in such a way that uh, inmates fed off inmates, the violence was there daily, inmates did shave their bodily hairs, uh, and they were traded off for, sec for, uh, for gambling debts. Now, Ms. Broby, uh, on the one hand, we have the, the former officer from Sing Sing who says, not that he saw. Uh, we have the man from Walpole saying back in the 70s, uh, bring us up to speed here. What's your experience from what's going on in the 90s? and not just in one prison, but what's your sense of what is going on in many prisons around the country? Generally, I think what the Human Rights Watch report shows, and certainly what my experience in Texas shows, that, is that at least in some prison systems and in many prisons across the country, prisoner victimization, prisoner victimization of other prisoners is a prevalent phenomenon. As the um, statements of your other guests show, it, it doesn't have to be that way. Pris rape, rape and other victimization does not have to be prevalent in prison, but in our society, in some systems and in many prisons, it is prevalent. Well, I'll tell you what, that's a, that's a good place to start when we come back in our next segment, because what I'd like you to talk about is what can be and what has been done in the better prisons where it is not the case, and then we'll go back and look at the other prison systems too. More with our guests in a moment. We're back with attorney Donna Brorby and former correctional officers Ted Conover and Michael McLaughlin. Ms. Brory, you were talking about prisons in which this kind of thing is not the case, and I gather it's not by coincidence and not by accident. What do they do in those prisons to ensure that it doesn't happen? Well, in the easiest set of cases, the, the case of the smaller prisons and the tinier prison systems in the United States, they don't have the stress on all the systems that are present in the larger prison systems and in the very large prisons we now build because it's cost effective to have prisons for four to six thousand people. Well, let me but just in jump in and say Sing Sing is a pretty big prison. I, s I certainly don't know Sing Sing directly, but it's, it's also true that in the more difficult prisons that are very typical in the United States today, um, it is possible to control victimization and, by and large, uh, prevent rape, at least when victims are willing to come forward. And, the, you know, the, probably the most important issue is attitude. Um, the, the public, or at least the people running the prisons who are often affected by the public, have to have an attitude that victimization and rape will not be permitted in the prison. And it, they have to be real about it. It can't just be that they have an attitude that they want to be able to defend lawsuits and not be successfully sued for rape in the prison, but they have to decide that they're going to prevent rape 
and other victimization in prison because prisoners are human beings and that shouldn't happen to them. Now, and uh, a problem. Let me just jump over to Mr. McLaughlin for a second because uh, while your experience, you, you left the, uh, the Massachusetts uh, prison system in what year, back in the 70s? Not, well, I, I worked there from 1976 to 1980, and I had about 10 years' experience as a correction officer at various levels. Why do you think it happened when it happened, and could it have been prevented, do you think, if there had been, been instructions from the warden saying, look, I'm just not going to tolerate this? It actually came from as high as the commissioner's office. The commissioner wasn't interested in seeing Walpole at that time run smoothly, and the superintendent found it to be uh, carte blanche to do as he willed. Uh, whenever there were acts of violence, whether they be rape or murder or various other forms of violence, you common, commonly heard the phrase, what do you expect in the big house? Um, I think unless managers are held accountable for their actions, prison rapes and other violence are going to continue. Why would it be to any commissioner's advantage not to care? Oh, you have to keep a lid on things. Uh, the less the public knows, the better. Uh, most prisons work under a policy called the gag order, which prevents correction officers and other employees from speaking out on day-to-day um, on -day operations. Um, that keeps the public uh, in the dark as to what's happening within the walls. And it gives these managers, uh, again, a, a degree of power over other people, whether they be employees or their, their charges, being the inmates. Mr. Conover, I, I know you took the, you took the job uh, at a prison strictly for the purpose of writing a book. Now, I take it that your, uh, your fellow correctional officers didn't know that at the time? That's true. That's right. Uh, is it your feeling that you were in a particularly good prison? I'd always heard that Sing Sing was a pretty rough place. Uh, no, it's not a particularly good prison, which led me to think I'd have plenty of this kind of thing to write about. Uh, believe me, I expected to find it, and I was poised to put down every detail, so I was kind of surprised not to. Uh, just to offer a little context, I, I may be wrong, but I've read a lot about U.S. prisons, and I think Walpole in the late 70s, early 80s was a famously wild place. I, I don't think it's like that now. And, and what about some of the other prisons that we're hearing about? Ms. Broby is talking largely about the Texas prison system. Well, you know, there were periods that Sing Sing was wild during that particular time, too. Uh, it's partly a function of, of the era of our history, but it is very much, as, as both of your other guests have indicated, a function of the administration. Every officer knows what you can get away with, what you uh, might allow to happen and should never allow to happen. And, and uh, we had a pretty strong message that the job involved care of the inmates as well as telling them what to do that the job was to keep them from getting hurt in ways uh, they weren't supposed to. And, uh, you know, there might be an exception made for an, an inmate you didn't like, an inmate who had attacked officers, but by and large, uh, if you saw an inmate with a wound, a distraught inmate, you tried to find out what was wrong. Ms. Broby, uh, I can understand if a few of our viewers out there might be a little confused now, because they, uh, especially if they have been reading about the Human uh, Rights Watch report, uh, because in there, for example, it is suggested that the number of men who may have been raped in the prison system could be as high as 140,000. Now, that would be a huge amount. And is it, in fact, your impression that that thing is going on so systemically in American prisons that that number is, is possibly correct? It's impossible to quantify prison rape because especially in the toxic prison systems and prisons where it's happening, nobody's counting. The stories, you, I've, I've heard hundreds of stories like the stories that your uh, Mr. Cook told at the opening of the program of prisoners who have been raped and otherwise victimized, who have gone to officers and ranking officials and asked for help and not been able to get it. People who are, have a history of child molestation offenses, prisoners who are gay, um, prisoners who are retarded or mentally ill. Um, the kind of prisoners that a lot of people don't like are commonly among the victims of extortion and beatings and rape in prison. And one of the reasons that they are the victims is because when they come forward, at least in some prisons and prison systems, the guards don't like them. And if you could very quickly, because I'd just like to end on this point, if you don't mind, to what degree is public apathy a factor here? 
public apathy is at the center of it. We don't demand of our public officials or the people running our prisons that they run prisons that are fit for human beings. It's because we don't care about prisoners. Poor people do, but they don't, are not the ones who exercise power in this society. Because we consider prisoners expendable, we look at them as other, we look at them as the people that we're afraid of. They're bad people, they're not like us. We don't care what happens to them. We let our prison officials not care what happens to them, and we let our public officials not care what happens to them. And on that note, Ms. Broby, I thank you very much. Mr. Conover and Mr. McLaughlin, thank you both also. I'll be back in a moment. Tomorrow on World News Tonight, the third part of its series on prison rape, how one correctional institution has taken steps to stop it. And that's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night.